you're calling back to hire and say, hey, these guys meet, meet the criteria. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, you're cleared hot, take the gun off safe. And then, you know, you have that, I call it my, your old shit moment. You know, you're like, oh, okay, this is real. But then you have to go to work, right? And then the spotter's like, okay, I got a target at XYZ and he's about 275, go ahead and dial up. There are multiple snipers online and they give the, the lead sniper team gives a three, two, one, fire, 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 and you are good at your job. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we have a combat story with Mark Green, a former Navy SEAL sniper who served as both a SEAL officer and enlisted member. Mark deployed both pre and post 9-11 to include deployments where his training as a sniper was used to lethal effects. Mark, like so many SEALs, would lose close friends and have his own close calls, both of which we cover in this episode, and is just a taste of what Mark has pulled together in his book, Unsealed, A Navy SEAL's Guide to Mastering Life's Transitions. Mark wrote this book in part to help others in all walks of life handle the tricky transitions we all face as we change jobs, roles, and more. With that, please enjoy this wide-ranging discussion from playing college football to completing buds, overcoming mental challenges, surviving close calls, and putting rounds on enemy combatants in combat as a sniper with Mark Green. Mark, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. I just wrapped up reading your book, Unsealed, A Navy SEAL's Guide to Mastering Life's Transitions. And several of the transitions you talk about in this book hit me hard because I feel like I went through some similar transitions, certainly going from military or government to civilian life and school and that sort of thing. Um, but you obviously make so many transitions. I think one of the first ones that I'd love to dive into is sports growing up. Uh, yeah, you know, you're yeah. a serious football player, but you have this grandfather who has a passion for something else. And I was hoping we could start there. So my grandfather, um, who was probably the biggest human I'd ever seen, you know, just a monster of a man. And we would come to the house and he would either grunt or not pay attention to us at all. You know, we were just in the way, uh, but you know, he's an old school guy. And one day we're walking into the house and the way the house is set up, you walk in the front door and you see my grandmother cooking something and it always smells good. And then he has this stash of cookies, right? And, or, and then my grandma's, uh, she's cooking and she's of course yelling at us to be quiet and stuff. So we know she's not, we, we know she's not serious. And then uh, all of a sudden grandpa's sitting in his chair, his throne, to the right and to the left there's a tv a black and white tv that's got um you know rabbit ears on it and all of a sudden he says hey boy and i knew it was talking i knew it was talking to me right and I, <laughs> I didn't want to look at him and i was like yes sir he's like come on over here and you know he has a seat for me and i didn't know i uh, he was such a foreigner to me that i was just like well, what the hell do you want me to do with that? You know, he's like, well, sit down. And he's like, I've seen you throw outside and I want to teach you how to play baseball. We're going to go outside and we're going to, I'm going to teach you how to pitch because I used to pitch. Grandpa used to pitch. And he was smiling. I was like, who is this guy? Right. But um, because at the time I was like, I don't even know if the guy likes me, but he's, he's passionate about it. And he's like, but before we go outside, there's this great game that we're going to watch. And he has his baseball mitt, you know, it's all beat up. It's the one he played when he was in the leagues. So I'm like, ooh, okay, baseball. Uh, you know, I every I, I threw some with my dad, but, you know, that's one of the old-timey things uh, of our era that you would sit and throw baseball with your, with your dad or your brother. Or that was just what you did. So I was excited to go play, throw baseball with my grandpa. And unfortunately, I had ADD and ADHD. And my grandma's cooking was really good. So he sits down and it's a pitcher's duel, right? So in, my, in his mind, it was a, an amazing battle between two aces, right? For me, I was like, well, every once in a while they hit that little white thing. Um, nobody actually gets on a base. And yeah, but he's just popping his mitt, right? And he's just like, ah, oh, son, did you see that slider? I was like... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I didn't even know the lingo. I was just like, so finally, um, ADD and ADHD kicked in and my grandmother's um, cooking overpowered me. It was the end of the ninth and he said, so, so son, what do you think? I was like, I know I'm never playing baseball. Bye, grandpa. <laughs> Took <off>. Out. <laughs> but you play, not... yeah. You end up playing football seriously though, right? Yeah. I mean, competitively in college. Yeah. Where, like, yeah. where does that come from? So when I came from, I was an Air Force brat and third generation. So my wow. grandfather was Army. My dad was Air Force. And um, we didn't have a lot of money. So if we were going to go to college, which we were supposed to go to college, we didn't have a way to pay for it. And so athletics was the thing. And I was big for my age and fast for my age. So what do you do back in 1981? You play football. So um, Mad River Tomahawks in Dayton, Ohio is my first All right. my first team. Yeah. And um, but my dad said, you know, I was nervous and he sat me down. I was like, hey, son, once you start something, we don't quit. And I was like, OK, that makes sense, Pop. But he, I mean, I was getting ready to walk away and he pulled me back. He's like, I don't, I don't know if you understand this. It's like, once you're on that field, if you play every, every down or you don't get a position you want to get, you're on this team and they rely on you. I was like, yes, sir. Wow. And I mean, it was like, it might as well have been in stone because that's, I mean, that was the catalyst for how I live my life to this day, you know? So I started playing football and, I was big and I was fast. And um, so I really did well. And one day I wanted to play quarterback. And uh, my grand, my dad told my grandpa, when we went home, I was like, and I didn't understand the conversation at the time. It's like, well, he didn't waste that arm. He's playing quarterback now. And my grandpa just kind of puffed up a little bit. And, you know, and that was it, you know. Um, oh, so that still. was my career. Yeah. And, not and, and what, once I learned what the Negro Leagues was, and when I got older, it, I learned at his funeral just how incredible of a pitcher he was. And they said he should have been the bigs, and he could throw a fastball. I mean, he just had a wide range. And finally, I understood what that moment meant when I was a kid that he was trying to teach me. And you know, I wish he the way my brain works. If he would have explained the game to me, then I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Get it. Yeah. But old school, he just like, and he was excited, you know, and, um, but he had that same excitement when I played football in college. So I played at Miami of Ohio. I went, I transferred to play at Kent state, which was only an hour and a half away from, um, where he played or where he oh, lived. Wow. Yeah. And my brother was a scholarship player at Ohio university. So he's his, and all the boys that were playing football in college and that man was just, you know, so Lord. proud. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's great. Yeah. That's so great. and so that didn't go to waste, you know, and um had some really good coaching. And um I got to work out with Randall Cunningham. When no way. Young. Yeah. Probably the nicest what? guy other than Chris Pratt that I've ever met. Oh man. Yeah. So, you know, I talked with them and he was at a he was at a football camp uh the buyer bayless football camp in dayton ohio dion would show up and oh uh, no way yeah that's awesome all, yeah all the big guys would show up so randall showed up i'm like who the hell is that and i because i didn't want to believe because he was he was tall but he was so thin he yeah, was was he like six five i just i could picture him running in like nfl films now and he just yeah, seemed so lanky yeah, he was six four and some change, and yeah. just all arms and legs, and just had this amazing arm. So I thought to myself, I was like, I only get one shot at this. So I embedded myself in his pocket for two days and just like teach me everything. What you got? And you, um, so he did. You have a knack for like Admiral Stockdale, right? Like <laughs> you have a knack for just finding people and and stick like hopping in their pocket. I think. Yeah, I, I think I was like socially awkward enough where I didn't see boundaries. I'm just like. He's here and I'm here. He's so, a quarterback. Yeah. He's going to, what, what else is he going to do but teach me? So he, as we were going through the camps, he would just kind of give me little highlights of stuff. And he'd say, hey, let me see you throw. I said, okay, you need to fix this and walk on your feet. So I would say, hey, you know, how come 
you know, nobody can get you. He's like, I get from under center on a drop back faster than anybody. He's like, so it just gives me a bunch of time. So he said, whenever you're dropping back, just work on getting away from the 300 pound machine that wants to kill you. Right. <laughs> it's like, get away from that guy as fast as you can. And then, you know, it gives you time. And that made so much sense. So then I took that away and that improved my game when I was at Miami. And I had a great coach, Randy Walker, who uh, unfortunately passed away at least 52 at Northwestern. Oh, geez. Yeah. Great. I mean, he was exceptional. And then they taught me the game. And one day, uh, Sean, I can't remember Sean's last name, but he was the coach. He's like, okay, scout team, we're going to actually run a play. And so he's like, okay, Mark, you're going to drop back. You're going to put this guy in motion. It's going to draw um, the linebacker's going to drop back and cover three. And then the DB is going to go into a cover two. You're going to do a play. You're going to do play action, which is going to freeze the linebacker. And then the way the route's set up, it's going to open up right at 11 o'clock. I'm like, oh, okay. seems like it's going to take a lot of time. But because okay. I didn't know football, <laughs> just, it's just raw talent. You know, you're, you're not actually coached yet. So we try and we drop back. I dropped back and it just opened up. And it opened, it was so prolific. I was just like, oh. it's like a science. Yeah. And and I was so surprised that I got sacked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> but I mean, at that at that moment, I learned football. I was like, okay, I get it. I get it. And then it was just. I you mentioned, it, you know, in the book, you describe, obviously, you alluded to getting injured, um, which derails what in the book you you describe as like, hey, I want to go take this to the next level and, and continue mm -hmm. on the football journey. I was wondering, did you have any inkling that you would go into the military as you were pursuing the football journey? Or was it strictly football until you, you get know, injured? It was always a possibility because I knew that, you know, getting to college was a big deal. But getting the NFL, I mean, come on, man. It's so, I mean, astronomical, your choices. So suppose being third generation, it was like always a possibility because I experienced the military as a, as a dependent. And my grandfather and dad used to talk about their experiences. And it was always an option. So it was always in the back of my mind. So, um, yeah, it was not a big stretch to join the military. After you get injured, I really want to go through this blockbuster experience. Um, I mean, it's like a visceral reaction as I was reading this. Can you just talk through this? Is I think the chapter is titled The Last Straw. But to talk us through where you're at in life as this happens that kind of propels you in. Okay, so I, I flunked out of college. Um, so like I said, I started at Miami, went to Kent State, got the injury. All my friends and family were down at Oxford, Ohio, where Miami is. So I went back and I just, I wasn't in college to go to college. I was in college as a means to an end to get somewhere else. I didn't have any study skills and I was just like lost really. And I ended up flunking out of college. And Mark, how upset were your parents given that college was something you were all expected to go do? Um, they were happy that I was there. They didn't, they, my, my father never found out I flunked out. No way. What? No, really? No. Oh, you don't okay. say do. do. Okay. And, um, I don't know if, I think my parents found out on one of these podcasts. My mom found out on one of these podcasts. <laughs> no way. Yeah. So, um, so she just now found out not, not too long ago. And I was like, mom, I must've forgot or something, you know? So I am working at Blockbuster and working at a, um, a video store or a bookstore. And I don't know if you remember that movie Clerks, but there was, remember that scene where he's like, you know, that one movie, that one guy, and he does this one thing, and the guy rattles it off because that's all he does is no movies. movies. Yeah. So this gentleman walked in, and Ryan, he just looked like a cartoon character, walked up and said, hey, man, you know, this movie about this girl, she like turns into an alien, just starts eating dudes and it's crazy. And I was like, yes, sir. I, I think so. He's like, yeah, yeah, man. Uh, it's called Speckies. And my heart broke, just absolutely shattered. And I look at him, I was like, sir, do you mean species? He's like, yeah. And at that point, I was like, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do this anymore. 
speckies, you have to respect the English language. It, it, come on, it's, it's too much. So finally, I just, I looked around and I'm like, nope, because my friend Jeff, who had introduced the SEAL stuff, it was always in the, it was, it was in the, it le leapt to the front of my mind and then life happened and it, you know, kind of took a step back and stuff. So fine, I'm just like, we're 24, you gotta go, you know, you're not getting any younger and you're going to keep putting it off because I knew myself. So all of a sudden I didn't want to leave that um, adventure on the table because I was so passionate about it and I just happened to lose it and find them. It's like, thank you, sir. You, you, you got, <laughs> you rejuvenated it. And, you helped uh, me out. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing this. Um, so I joined the Navy, joined the Navy the next day, wow. went down to the recruiter and said, all right, what it was the fastest thing out of here, and he said I can get it was, I think it was like mid June. He's like I can get you out of here July seventh. I was like, that's it. And was it for seals to start? So back then we didn't have a contract. He just showed up and said, hey, I want to be a seal, and they say get out of here. Nobody does that. Um, and so I told him I, I was like I want to be a seal. I want to go into the seal contract. So I got a seal source rating, which is an MOS for the Navy. Um, and then I got one that qualified me for going to training and showed up at boot camp and not, not researching anything. They hand me these blue dungarees, right? And I'm like, good God, that's an awful uniform. Who wears that? <laughs> then they hand me the, the even worse dungaree blue shirt. I'm like, oh, I was like, sir, I don't like, if you understand, I need the Navy SEAL uniform. And he looked at me, he's like, you probably can't even swim. Get out of here. This is this is what you got. And I was just like, okay, mistake number one, you know, like <laughs> so. Um, but you know, as this is it, you gotta join the Navy to be a SEAL. And so I did that and was figuring out boot camp. And then we had the SEAL motivators come in, right? And they showed the video again that I saw back in 91. And as soon as I heard that music, I'd seen the video like a thousand times, right? But as soon as it, he hit the VCR and hit play on it, right? And I think it's probably a beta unit because it was a uh, Navy. Yeah. But anyway, so he he rolls the tape and I'm just fired up all over again. And the guy's name was Steve Brown. He had a porno mustache and could just strong as and could swim forever. And I'm just like, okay, I'm back. It's back, you know. So he lets us know when the trials are going to be. And, and I was like, oh, 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 oh. I got it. I got it. Because I can swim. I could run. I could do push-ups all day, sit-ups all day. And uh, however, the one I didn't plan for were pull-ups. Big strong guy, you know, 6'2", 200 pounds of twisted steel, right? And uh, <laughs> what are pull-ups? <laughs> so we do the swim. We do the push-ups. We do the sit-ups. And then we hop up to do the pull-ups and i think i got either two or three and they were the worst pull-ups i've ever seen <laughs> and you're only given a couple weeks right to to make this up yeah that is yeah, not a lot yeah. of time for something like yeah. pull-ups no because i think i i think we had like three or four weeks right and and you know i i needed that kick in the butt to say okay you're not ready for you didn't prepare enough for what you're doing. And um, so each night, lights out, I get a towel and just do pull-ups over the, the commodes, over the latrines, right? And um, and each, the first week, I was just sore, sore, I was really sore. Second week, I started making improvements. Third week, I could get eight. And then the fourth week, I could get 10 you know, perfect pull-ups, but that was in a vacuum where we hadn't done in the other part of the test. So I knew I was, I knew I was close. Right. And, um, so we have the other test again, like green, I think Brown instructor Brown's like green. I better not see that ugly shit. I saw the other time. I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> so, um, so I do the swim again, do that, do this push-ups again, improve on that, improve on my sit-ups. But I was like, okay, I'm a little tired, you know, and uh, then come the pull-ups and one, 
strong two strong three strong four like i'm feeling four um <laughs> five six uh ugly but i still made it seven and then i came up on eight and Ryan, I don't know to this day if I would have made my eighth one, but I saw my window and for some reason, I don't know if it's divine intervention or what happened, but for an instant, somebody yelled over to Steve and say, hey, instructor, and he looked over and I'm like, okay, you had a choice to make, because I'm right here at the bar, right? And I was like, you have a choice. You can either integrity be damned and just get it just to get it, or your dream goes away and you go out into the fleet. And I was like, okay. And I lifted my chin up over the bar and that was just enough to pull me up to get my eighth pull up. And he looked at me and he's just like, you bastard. I know exactly what happened. I was like, what? <laughs> so, um, so I got it. And, he, and, he, and once I heard eight, he counted out eight. So no matter what he thought about it, he, he counted out eight. And I had hopped down and uh, he's like, don't get cocky, you still have the run. But I was a talented runner, so I was like, yeah, whatever. Um, but had I, I didn't know that prior to me going, the drill the drill instructors for our class had gone to the SEAL motivators and say, hey, this dude's been, he doesn't think we know, but he's been doing pull-ups every night. Wow. For hours. So, you know, it's, and they just, they, I think they wanted to see that I wanted it so bad that, that's what I was willing to do. Yeah. And, and I did. So afterwards, I passed the test and he's like, Green, just work on your pull-ups, man. I was like, Yes, sir. I was gonna say, you know, there's I've you know, having read and interviewed um SEALs now, I often hear this phrase like there's no no such thing as a fair fight. And you, you know, you said kind of this integrity be damned. Yeah, if you uh -huh. want to play it by the book, you 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 do it a slightly different way. But at the same time, there's this element of what you're going to be expected to do when you're downrange, which is mm -hmm. take advantage of every opportunity. And you kind of had an opportunity and you took it. Yeah. And, and I think you kind of have to there. Like it's a risk. You did it. I was, it was, I weighed everything in a split second. And yeah. that then to get my that eighth pull up was worth it. I did something similar when I was I did it when I was at the agency. We did an advanced um, kind of like surveillance course that was just brutal for me. It, for most people, it's brutal, and they've got trackers on you, all kinds of stuff. And they're like, the only thing you can't do is run. You just cannot run. Don't miss your time, but do not hmm. run. And you're out for hours, hours and hours, moving around places. And and I was dangerously close to missing a window. And I was like, I'm going to run. Like there's no chance I'm going to miss my window. And if they catch me running, then they catch me running. But you know, like I had to weigh everything, you know, in a split second to your point. And I was like, I'm just going to fail the integrity part here, but I'm going to make damn sure I'm there if my asset shows up to this meeting. Um, so I, I could absolutely appreciate as you were talking about it in the book, the, the weight there and just like, whoo, I got by that guy Ooh. knows you got one by him, but Hey, you made it. But Ryan, you know what I do now as a penance to that, that day of cheating, I still go to the gym four days a week, right? And every time I have my upper body workout, I do eight perfect pull-ups and I don't have to do it, but in my back of my mind, I still am like, I have even, especially after writing the book, I was like, you got away with one. So, you know, you got to pay for it. So eight perfect pull-ups. Yep. That's awesome. Well, Maybe if we transition to buds, um, I don't often spend a lot of time as I'm interviewing folks talking about the training side, even buds, but there are a few things that I read here that I wanted to to touch on if it's all right. And one was this comment that one of the instructors makes to you that buds isn't for you. It's for these other people. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I've ever read that or heard that before. I was hoping you could explain it, the context and, and what it means. So I, we were going through and you, you had this buildup of what Buds is going to be, right? And what Hell Week is going to be. That's all you hear about. You don't hear about much after Hell Week because, you know, few people make it and then, you know, they're off doing their own thing. So you don't really hear a whole lot about the rest of training. So we go through the first five weeks, four weeks of phase, and then we go through Hell Week. And Friday happens and they secure us on Friday. And I thought that, you know, I was going to you know have my shirt and I was just going to open it up, right? And it's going to have this S on it. And I'm just going to start, you know, flying away like Superman, right? And 
I didn't feel any different. I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm just tired. I'm out of my mind right now. Just sleep it off. And then Monday came by, Tuesday came by, Wednesday. And I'm just like, I feel like the same guy that I was before I showed up. Even though you so, passed this even though I passed. gauntlet. Yeah. 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 And and I really, I really thought that it was just going to be this life-changing event. So I was talking to the instructor and he could see something was wrong because I wasn't smiling anymore. He's like, all right, Green, what's up? It's like, well, instructor, I don't feel any different. He's like, have a seat. He's like, you need to understand something. He's like, whatever life happened to you, whatever your upbringing taught you about adversity and mental toughness and stuff, you've had that your entire life. Buds is not for you. And then I was like, well, what do you mean? It's like, Buds is for, see all those helmets over there? Buds is for those guys. Because everybody wants to be a, a frogman on Friday, is, this, and this is the saying. But um, it's like the work it takes to get there, not a lot of people want to do. So, yeah, you're not going to feel any different because you've been a SEAL your whole life. And I'm just like, also, I've been awesome this entire time. <laughs> Smiles back. Yeah, smiles back because because I understood it. I got it. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Okay, so that makes sense. So then he's just like, no, you know, don't get out of here. You stink. And like, you know, so um, but that that was a lesson that that really carried me through that. And um, and I experienced the same thing with finishing college for the first time, and then finishing grad school, and then finishing grad school again. That sense of like, once I get this piece of paper, I'm going to be smarter. Yeah. Right. So I get the piece of paper from Naval Postgraduate School with an MBA. And I'm like, I said, I feel any different. I think a little bit differently. Right. But, but I don't feel a whole lot differently. So then that each time came back and it's like, yeah, you're not going to feel different because this is who you are. I've, I've had very similar feelings and I've never seen somebody describe it this way, which is why it hit me so hard, um, especially coming out of training that I was just really, kind of excited about, but also dreading, get, you know, SEER school and, yeah. and trade craft and these different things, flight school. And then you get on the other end and you just feel like, all right, things should be different and nothing changes. I was wondering though, did you feel that way when you came back from a deployment? Like maybe your first deployment, did you have, because for a lot of us, that's, that's like a rite of passage. That's what we're doing all this for in many cases. And did you, I don't know, did you have that same feeling? No. It was different because when I first deployed back in 99, we weren't, there wasn't a whole lot going on. And so I was kind of disappointed. It's like, well, we, you know, we went and trained indigenous forces somewhere else, but you know, where's the high speed stuff. <clears throat> so that was a little bit disappointing. And then um, September 11th happened on my second deployment. So we went ahead and, and did some things and I was like, okay, that was, that was cool. But um when I went on my actual combat deployment, my, at first, the first of all, somebody asked like, Hey man, how do you feel? I was like, well, I'm scared of shit. What are you talking about? You know, and, it's every, and some of the other guys like, Oh man, I'm, I'm good, bro. I was like, well, you're full of shit. Cause I'm, you know, you know, everything's real now, you know, yeah. it's not notional. It's not a simulation. Like I hear gunfire off in the, in the distance and that shit's real. And I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah, okay, this is this is different. And my alarm clock every morning after morning prayer was the morning explosion. And the first time I heard that my first morning waking up in Iraq, eight o'clock, you hear this the the prayers going off, and then boom, right? And the first time I thought it was, I thought the explosion happened right next to my bed. The jump, I, I mean, I jumped out of bed. My AR was right next to me and I popped up and everyone's like, what is wrong with this guy? Like he just got here, you know? And, and I was like, okay, what the, what was that? So we, we go into the, the talk and they have the, the incident reports. So I remember looking at my watch and it was, it was 804 and it said the 804 explosion happened 12 miles away. And it felt like it was right next to my bed. And, you know, I was just like, this is crazy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it was just nuts. And then you'd get all the reports and route Irish where, you know, yeah. all the IEDs were going up. And, and it, I was like, okay, this is this is it. So then you hope your training prepares you for what's next. So then you settle in and you get into the rhythm of, you know, um, getting data sets and getting target packages and getting approvals and hopping on the bird for the first time to go out and work. And it was it was good to get out. We eased ourselves into it because the first couple were just dry holes, but we went through mm -hmm. the entire exercise and we had an interpreter. We were getting ready to go on route Irish and we were so like the the army and the conventional forces that went out, they just their posture was different. So we went out and our interpreter was in the middle of us. And our posture was so aggressive that it was like, okay, if something happens, we're not running away. We're we're finding it and we're coming to get it. And the interpreter said that they had a name for us. I can't remember what it was, but basically it was like, these are the different ones, their postures. We don't want basically it was we don't want this fight, so we're good. And so the the interpreter's like, yeah, these guys don't they know they know you're around and they don't want it's not a fight they want right now. And does that start from just like rolling outside the wire in a certain way? Like you're moving yeah. every, everything from the get go yeah. is different. Yep. It's just, there's no, we're not relaxed, right? It's like guns are up. The posture's different or something about us is different. We have beards and, you know, they're just like something's different about these guys that we don't want to have anything to deal with. And so we would go down the route and they would be ready to clack off or have um, a small hit, but they knew that we were coming after them. We weren't running away. So um, that was the introduction. Is is that first deployment the one that you refer to in the book where you have this really strong team where the platoon is really great? Or was that your kind of pre-9-11 first deployment? That No, that, um, that was my last one. That was my... Okay. Well, I was at 03. And, but they were all super strong. But these were my guys um, in the book that I explained kind of late in the book. And I got my leadership style down and my chief and I were, you know, un inseparable. And it was different when they're your guys, you know, they come to you with their problems and they say, Hey, and and it was open they're like, Hey, Mark, you're kind of screwing this one up. I'm like, wow. It. Yeah. This is when you're in the leadership role, you're saying, yeah. right? but as you transition to the officer side. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was uh, doing my officer in charge and so I had really strong personalities and the dialogue was open and I'm like, hey, if I'm screwing this up, man, you gotta let me know. Because if I think I'm right and you guys are afraid to say, no, no we can't do that. But, you know, I learned a lot because those guys were, um, had so much experience, right? And I, we had, there was, there was a mutual respect. It wasn't yeah. a, you know, when some guys interact with poor leaders, it's, it, you know, it's going to be a pretty volatile um situation but my guys were just awesome and there was a lot of camaraderie in that platoon and um you know i was in charge but when i asked like hey what'd you see on that and they would give me their feedback and i demanded that i was like hey you gotta let me know because yeah i'm doing this wrong and we go forward and i'm doing it wrong then you know somebody's not going to come back because uh, i don't know what right looks like or i'm a little bit slow on this or i didn't see the big picture on this thing. And it was, it was usually small course corrections as opposed to big muscle yeah. movements, but you know, it, it was important. Those, I see the special operations community as incrementally better than across the board on what they do. Shoot, move and communicate, not hard, but we just have that nailed. Right. And everything goes shoot, move and communicate. And then getting nailing basics on that and you nail the basics on diving you nail the basics in the house and then you nail the basics in land warfare and it was just you're incrementally different and you're highly consistent which is the hardest i think the hardest part being an athlete and looking at yeah lebron james or tom brady or michael jordan or whoever the greats are and it's like they're consistently exceptional I wanted to jump. I'm probably going to go back in time here, but okay. the near de near death experience number one, I think, is it fast roping where this goes down? Yeah. Please tell that story because this this makes your hands sweat just listening to it. 
Just a quick word from our sponsor, Mint Mobile, and we'll get right back to this combat story. My favorite spring cleaning takeaway is the post-clean clarity you get. Wow, how have I been living like this? It's kind of like when you find out you've been paying a fortune for wireless when Mint Mobile has phone plans for $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. Wow, how have I been affording this? It's time to switch to Mint Mobile and get unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. My experience with Mint Mobile is exactly like the other carriers I've used. I just took it on a trip to Florida and it worked perfectly from the moment we stepped off the plane to the beach to the car. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash combat story. That's mintmobile.com slash combat story. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash combat story. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And now, back to this combat story. And so I was a brand new guy, and, you know, workup's going pretty, and fire hose on full blast, you know, it's it's moving pretty fast. So we have this exercise with the carrier group and everybody's together. So we are doing our first real world visit board search and seizure PBSS. So we, we meet with the pilots and we're actually having helos with us this time. And we actually have a platform and bad guy role players and stuff. So this is, this is a big one. So the pilot comes in and is like, all right, fellas, I'm the CEO here. And, uh, it's going to be the best op you've ever seen. I was like, oh, man. And as a new guy, my chief and the other guy was just like, oh, this freaking guy. But I was like, okay, this guy's, this guy's dialed in. Okay. And so the strong Texan uh, was, it was a different, it was a small platform. You had booms and cranes and weird stuff on the ship happening. So we did the crawl, walk, run. You know, we did a flyover and then we did a, we did a profile and everything was nice. And I was like, oh, this guy is good. <laughs> so fast forward to the FTX at night and the waves, the sea state is almost at its limit, right? And all of a sudden it's a brand new ballgame because it's at it's midnight. The platform is doing like this, right? And there are cranes and there's it's it's a varsity level up. So the pilot body language, he was he was tight on that stick. So he comes, the first crew comes over, eight guys go down lightning fast and pull off. How far is the rope on this one, Mark? 30 feet to the deck because we have to be above the cranes. That sounds so long. Yeah, that was a long one. So we're going down and the crew chief says two more. The pilot thought he said no more. So as I'm going down, the gentleman in front of me, Todd, hits the deck and goes on. And I'm going as fast as I can down the rope. And all of a sudden, I'm looking down, and the platform's going away. I was like, well, where's the ship going? <laughs> you know? So, um, And in, in Buds, they teach you how to climb up a rope and then stand on it to where you're stable. And I was just going to, you know, stand on the rope. And, you know, I was, I was, I was way down, but I was still able to kind of make the climb. And then something happened, either something caused a whip in the line, enough so to where I look up and I see it coming. And I look down and I'm just like, well, guess where you're going? Snap me right off. And we had gained elevation. And then we're, we don't have the, the, the ship underneath us. So I probably fall 80 to 100 feet. And, you know, the first thing I think, I was like, what am I doing wet right now? Because, you know, I was supposed to be on the deck of a ship, you know, doing cool guy stuff. So I'm in the, I'm in the water and I'm like, holy shit, I'm in the water. So we have our UDT life vest on. First thing I do is I pop my vest and it's like, okay, I'm good. Well, 200 plus pounds of just myself and then full body armor, Danner boots back in the day. Remember how heavy those things were? Um, SIG and AR. So I'm 260 plus and that thing's not rated for me. So I pull it 
thinking I'm safe. And then I start sinking. And so I'm like, okay. But I look at the ship and like I said, the sea state was really high. So I was getting full on waves crashing in my face. Um, and I was just burning my throat. I'm like, okay, I got to turn around. But I go to turn on my strobe light and hear that disgusting, like, zzz, 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 and it just shorted out. So I was like, okay, of course that went around, it went down. So then I had- So, a so you're camoed up. You're in the ocean at night. Yeah. Out in the in it's, rough seas. It's, yeah, it's two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we were in between San Clemente Island and- um and San Clemente or Catalina. So if you're not familiar with the West Coast geography and, you know, biological stuff out there, it's great white breeding ground out there. So they give us a safety brief that, hey, where we're flying, we're in great white country and it's feeding time. So I'm in the water and I'm starting to splash around and I realize like, oh, you're getting ready to be food. All right, to fix your shit and figure this thing out. So I turn on my, my small light because I can't face the ship anymore because I'm just getting, I'm drowning. So I had to turn away from the ship and the ship's just going away. And I hear the helicopter coming back and it's doing a figure eight trying to look for me. So I was on the outside of that figure eight. And so they, they just didn't see me. And the worst sound I've ever heard in my whole life was that helicopter flying away. And I was like, it's not coming back because they don't know I'm here. So then I'm like, I don't know which direction's east or west, uh, but I had my fins on. I'm getting ready to put my fins on. And um, we had just gotten the Gen 1 night vision scope. Wow. The rifle. And we weren't supposed to have it. And one of the guys in our platoon had stolen it from supply for the exercise. So they pick him up. He's like, hey, I got nods. I think we can find them. So he mounts the nods and he's up in the helicopter and um, a couple miles away, he just sees this little pen light in the middle of the ocean. And he's like, I think I got him. So the helicopter comes in and the best sound I've ever heard was that helicopter coming towards me. So, um, you know, they they hover above me so I know they see me. And then the, the rescue swimmer comes, you know, jumps in the water and he's got his script. He's like, hey, I'm here to save you, man. And I'm like, hey, man, I get it, but can you get me out of the water? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. So he, he hooks the finger on me and hoists me up. But um, I was out there for at least 45 minutes. And I was. What? Oh, yeah, I was out there for a while. Mm -hmm. Is is there a hypothermia scare there? I mean, I know it's it's oh, California, but it's the Pacific. I mean. Yeah, 52 degrees. Yeah, I was I was I was hyped out. Wow. Were you mm -hmm. shedding any, like getting rid of your body armor? I was getting ready to, but I knew the guys would give me so much shit. For... <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> crazy the way they... Yeah, which sounds stupid right now, but it's like, oh, I can't ditch this gear. Because if I make it, those fuckers aren't going to let me <laughs> live it down. So they hoist me up and I get into the helicopter and my officer in charge is in the, in the bird. He's like, Oh, you know, you all case of beer. And I had my gun and I raised it up to just strike him. <laughs> Cause I was like, you bastard. I was, I almost died. Yeah. You're talking about the beer. And, um, so I, uh, we made it in and they, they, and they had to cut off all my stuff. Right. So we're going on the flight, the flight deck and, they shut down all air operations on an aircraft carrier. That doesn't happen, right? So they cut off all my stuff and everybody's gathered around. And it's my George Costanza moment. Shrinkage. <laughs> yeah. And I looked at it, I was like, this is not representative. <laughs> Probably everybody's there. Like, what shut down? What shut yeah, down? Yeah, yeah. And this naked oh guy is just, and I'm just like, God damn it. Oh. So they get me up to the to the infirmary and um, two guys walk in and they're like, and I noticed that everyone had kind of popped up to attention, but I didn't care. So this guy walks, he's like, son, what happened? I was like, that shithead of a pilot didn't know what the hell he was doing. The guy almost got me killed. And then everybody's just like, oh, what happened? So, and the general was like, all right, son, you take care of yourself. 
and I walked out. I was like, well, who the hell was that? He's like, well, that was the pilot who <laughs> dumped you in the drink. <laughs> Deserved it. Yeah, he earned that one. So, um, but, and I tell that story. And over the years, I've gone through, you know, different types of modalities for, you know, therapy and stuff like that. And they're like, you don't seem like this bothers you. And I was like, I didn't, I was like, I don't understand what you mean. It's like, well, didn't this traumatize you? I was like, no, not really. I mean, it's a good story, but I'm not like, I don't have night sweats or anything. It's just what happened. And that just blows them away. It's like, that should have caused you some trauma. It's like, mm, no, it's a great story. But I mean, I survived it. So where, yeah. where's the trauma? You know, were you were you at some point in the water coming to terms with like, oh yeah, I was dead. What, yeah, I might not make it out of this thing. Oh no, I knew no, I, I knew I was gonna die. I was just gonna die either swimming towards Catalina, or swimming towards San Clemente, or swimming north or south where I'd never see anything. You know, but I wouldn't. I mean, I was going to die trying. You know, I was getting ready to put my, yeah. I was getting ready to dump all my stuff and um, just go. To start swimming and um but yeah I, I went through that whole process of you know you got a kid at home and she's never gonna see her father again and um yeah that that was real and you maybe you didn't uh have much long-term trauma from that because you've had other near-death experiences like when you get trapped under the boat which we'll uh -huh. leave for people to read in the book because that one scares the hell out of me like ever if you're ever on a cruise ship this is like the worst thing that could happen um but I guess the other thing I wanted to touch on was maybe if we talk about Michael here, who you refer to, like even before you get to combat, you end up losing somebody like you probably realize how real this line of work is even in training. So we had, this happened early. So we had just come back from our first deployment. We were, he had gotten some sniper school and I got roped into sniper school and you can, the stories in the book, I got, I got roped in. So we're going through sniper school and it's 10 weeks and it just sucks and then the bill came up for military free fall and instead of going out to benning and they go to yuma we were doing this test course where you do basically do a civilian speed course and then you put on the you know you do the military free fall after that so he was he came over the house on we had dinner on sundays and we were just bow tired. I could see it in his face. He's like, I don't, I'm not sure I want to go because I've already missed a couple of uh, already missed a couple of days. And me, I was like, dude, just stay home. We've been going at it pretty hard. And I was like, you're the golden child. You're gonna, you'll, if anybody gets a, another billet, you're going to get it. So just, just stay home. And he thought about it for a second and, and I knew he wasn't going to, he's just, he was just that guy. He was yeah, going to go. Mm -hmm. So he's, and I was like, well, be careful out there and I'll talk to you on Friday or I'll talk to you on Saturday. Say, all right, I'm sure I'll have some good stories for you. And then Wednesday came around and there was just something that something had happened. So the CO came out and XO came out and said, Hey, uh, we've had a, we've had a death and, um, Mikey's passed away. And I just remember my whole, like, soul. Like, you have a soul-crushing experience. It was like a family member had died. And I was like, I just saw Mike the other, literally the other day. And we had been through so much together. And and I, I was in shock. So the XO comes over to me and said, hey, Mark, I got something you have to do. I was like, yeah, boss, what is it? He's like, Mike's wife is and son is at Balboa. Car's broken down. I need you to go pick her up and take her home. He's like, but you cannot say a word about Mike being dead. Chaplain has to go over, CO, XO, Master Chief. And he's like, I know this is shitty, but if anybody else goes, it'll be, it'll seem weird. And she'll be like, why are you here? And so it's like, figure it out, go get dressed and, you know, do not say a word. I'm like, yes, sir. So I get in the car. And you she know her. Like, oh, yeah. We're, you know yeah. her well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Our kids were born right around the same age. So 
I'm driving her home and smiling in all the right spots and and stuff. And she's just planning on what they're gonna do for the weekend. And I just feel like such a turd because I knew, right? And so I drop them off and it's like, okay, I'll see you guys later. And go back to the command. And then they showed up, the CMC and CO and everybody showed up. And um, one of the wives was there and when they showed up, like, what are you guys doing here? And she was, you know, smiling. And then it hit her. And she's like, well, what are you guys doing here? And then they told her and it was just mayhem. But I, you know, we had to go over there and I'm driving as slow as I can because I know what's coming. And um, I walk in the door and we lock eyes. And it was... She didn't have to say a word because it was like, you, how could you do this to me? We've sat in a car for an hour and you let me talk. And I, and I just played the whole scene over and over again yeah. and hate. I think in that moment there was hatred or so much grief. Right. And the only way she could lash out or, or express it was, right at me because you know you knew and you know as i was writing the book and every time i tell the story it's just like i'm back in july 12 2000 and um that was the i think that was the hardest because it was the first time he had died but it seemed like it was a meaningless death you know we survived deployment we just survived all the stuff and he dies in a freakish. They they did the investigation. It was almost astronomical the malfunction he had. And you know, I don't know how true this is, but they said they couldn't they couldn't recreate it in the investigation. So I'm just like, man, it was just it was just his time to go. And um, but I never I never really recovered because he was just a rock star. You know, and he was going to go over to tier one at some point. He was just going to be a legendary seal and, you know, loved his family. And he was just a good, he was just a great guy. And just to lose him at 25, I think he was 25, 26. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, and it just, it makes you see your own mortality, even though the yeah. job's dangerous and, you know, you're training for combat and, going behind enemy lines and doing tough stuff the entire the entirety of your career what's strange you never think about dying or if you do think about dying you don't die in training right that's how we lose most of our guys mm -hmm. that's the first people we lost when i was in a unit was pre-deployment doing a gunnery exercise and they just at night flew straight into the ground and and mm -hmm. much like the way you described this describe michael the the guys that were flying were better than me. They were proficient. We were doing the same exercises and they just lost it for a second. And that was mm -hmm. it. And it was in training. It wasn't even downrange. Yeah. So it's, and it just reminds you of how uh, you're not invincible, you know, as young as mm -hmm. you want to be. It's and real. Michael was so much better than I was at everything. Except running. Big boss who couldn't run. Am I getting this straight, Mark, that you still, you, you never really figured out if his wife has forgiven you for this? I have no idea. I hope she has. Yeah. I hope she wow. has. I, I want to say, I want to say yes, because before, she, and she completely left the community, didn't, yeah. didn't dip back in at all. But I had heard through a mutual friend of ours that, you know, she understands. But until I hear it, and I don't want to reach out to her and say, hey, do you forgive me? And her say no. You know, so I'm just in this weird spot of, you know, I want to see their son and I just want to tell them about his dad. And um, hopefully I'll get that option or that opportunity to do that. I hope but, you do.
was there anything memorable from that first deployment, um, an op or something that you did that was just kind of set the tone for, Hey, this is what deployments are going to be like now post 9-11. Yeah. yeah. So we were, I was, um, I earned my sniper qualification enlisted. Now I was a, an O one and I got to go out and do some sniper work. So we were downtown and, you know, target rich environment. And so we, went into a house and you know made a, an urban sniper hide and the our support people were guarding all the um ingress and egress for the enemy in case so we wouldn't get ambushed because we're sitting on glass the whole time but what you're taught counter sniper which means that you can see out on the battlefield but there's somebody out there who's trained just as well as you are who's looking at you so your everything has to be you know, you have to be invisible up there. I mean, like the way you set up, if the wind blows, it could blow your your cover. Or if you didn't cover up your optic, sun comes in the right way. You know, all that stuff you're you're cognizant of. So we're on glass and we're, you know, doing a range card, basically like, hey, target, the target comes over here, that's 200 yards away. And then we're looking at indicators in an urban environment. Um the indicator is just like a flag that shows which way the wind's blowing. But in a city, it's coming from all over the place. So what we had to do is we had to look at the, the cement and there are different phases of wind. So if the wind's not um, blowing at all, the mirage is what's called a boil. And so if there's no wind, the mirage is just coming straight up. Mm. So you have no wind. Oh, but when the wind is pushing it, you can see the mirage bend towards the direction of the wind. So we're checking indicators and the prevailing wind direction is right to left at 10 to 12 miles an hour. So you know you have to, at 200 yards, you have to hold X, Y, and Z and out to 800 yards. So, you know, we're doing that. And this is like real. And you see targets out there and you're given, hey, you're calling back to hire and say, hey, these guys meet, meet the criteria. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, you're cleared hot. And you're like, oh, take the gun off safe. And then, you know, you have that, I called it my, your oh shit moment. You know, you're like, oh, okay, this is real. But then you have to go to work, right? And then the spotter's like, okay, I got a target at XYZ. And he's about 275. Go ahead and dial up so, so-and-so. And then there are multiple snipers online and they give the, the lead sniper team goes to three, two, one, fire, 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 and you you are good at your job, you know. And then life happens, and people start scattering, and the chaos happens that you don't plan for. Is not role players chaos, like people who've been shot at before and know where to go, and then you know they're trying to figure out where you're shooting from. But in the city, it reverberates off of everything, so gigs up but you know a bunch of gringos show up in the city and take over an apartment they know where you are yeah. so then they just kind of start you know figuring out where you are and you just hear 300 wind mag or 308 going off and you know okay i got it's a good hit that's a good hit that's a good hit and you know it's crazy but you know you're at and those environments about 300 yards is i might as well be shooting across the living room wow yeah you're, you're just so proficient at that point yep mm -hmm. and you're i mean you've dialed your gun in and you know you've taken care of it and you know you baby that thing so when it's ready to to go you know when you take your first shot um so we we, we weren't on the ground so we had to build up a um we had to build up a shooting position with tables or whatever was available and, you know that first shot you know, kind of kicks you around a little bit and throws your gun off target. So you readjust and then, you know, you got to readjust quickly. And then, you know, we're calling for extract. And all of a sudden, this this kid who hadn't been out of the jock for his entire time, they let him come out and he's guarding the door. The plan and ID right at our exit. And those two kids who'd been out, they been wanting to get on target and two of those kids um either got severely injured or passed away i'm not sure both seals 
No, no, they were just they were regular army guys. Oh. And they were on the QRF and the uh, blocking force. So they were just like, it, it always got spicy out there. And they just wanted to get, they just wanted to get into it. And they, they knew, they knew where we were. So they set IDs where the Bradleys would come and pick us up. And boom. Yeah. So then everyone panics, but then like, hey, we got to get out of here. So, you know, you, IEDs be damned, you got to go. And, you know, you hear all the gunfire coming and you hear the gunfire hitting the Bradley and you hop in and they shut the door and you all ass out of there. And you're just like, okay, that was a lot. You know, and, and you're on glass. So when you're on glass is your hour on, hour off. So I'm mm. looking at targets and then you get tired and then, then I take on the spotter rule and then the other guy and I call win for him. So we're doing that all day and then um, chaos happens and then we have to wait till dark to, to get extracted because everybody kind of comes out at dusk and it was dusk and then it got crazy after that. And you're just sitting there waiting, knowing that you got to wait till it gets dark. Yeah, well, that's the training scenario, but real world, mm. like you got to get out of here. Get out. Waiting on darkness, it's like you got to get out of there now because it's not going to get any better with time. Yeah. So they're just mobilizing and getting you out of there, which is their mission, right? But um, you know, I learned a lot that day. It was it was just, you know, it's not like the movies; people don't die right away, even with a high powered rifle, and. Um, you know, those bullets are real and they're pointed right at you. And so that was, um, that was humbling for lack of a better term. You seem like a very, especially in the book, it comes through like a very empathetic, humble person mm -hmm. did, did and, and even the way you just described, like the first time you're pulling the trigger, you've got a target there. It's a human. It's, it's for real. You're taking the, the weapon off safe any it, like how how did you reflect on that i assume right after you pull the trigger you're just in the moment you're you're working but when you get back to the base that night is there anything going through your head as a sniper like you just looked at this guy in the scope and it took a life yes because you see faces you know if you're you do it long enough you at certain distances 200 yards you can still you can still see features of the face 250 and 300 you start to see the shadow over the eyes i mean they're there are a bunch of different things that kind of let you know the distance of the target. Wow. So, you know, once I couldn't see his eyes, I could just see the shadows. I knew he was at 250 or 300, and I think my dope was set at 275. So it was just, you know, you, you're, I think snipe, being a sniper is the closest zen, thing to Zen you can get. Because no matter what chaos is going on, you got to keep that that crosshair on target, and and you just block out everything that's going on. It kind of goes. I mean, you focus everything you can, and you know, you with each heartbeat that scope is bouncing. You're like, damn it, settle down. Wow, right? You know, you have to settle yourself down. You got to gr you we grunt and like, Argh! and then it just kind of kind of dissipates all that nervous energy. And then you just kind of, and then you settle down and you're like, okay. And then you go through the front side focus, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. You don't see, so the interesting thing is you don't actually see the hit. Your spotter mm. says, okay, good, because if I would have missed, which, you know, come on. But um, but if you would have missed, he's like, hey, come down a minute, over a minute, and re engage. So that happens like right now. So it's like, yep, good hit. And then you know, okay. Good hit. Where's my next target? Next target's at seven o'clock. He's, you know, looks like he's about 225. Um, and he's aware, which means he's kind of effective fire. So you you have your oh shit moment and usually you're gonna go back to work. You right? you're back. Yeah. So then after a while you just kind of go over it in your head and you're like, man, that uh at the time I didn't know you had a kid or wife or something, but then you start reflecting on um what what did that guy have at home? Did he have anything at home? Did I make another terrorist today? You know, so then um, that's where 
you start to, you know, you don't forget those, those engagements, especially the first time. And it's not like the movies or anything like that. So, um, especially yeah, seeing the face, there's, there's something yeah. about that. Like in an Apache, you know, we'd watch people before they could hear us sometimes mm -hmm. and, yep. you know, get clearance, we pull a trigger and they would be life size. Like we'd have, we, you know, we have a couple different ways that we could see a target sometimes in like a regular TV mode, sometimes it's thermal. Um, so thermal, obviously it's like a blob, but in the TV mode, like you can see a person clearly, but it's typically a silhouette of, mm -hmm. of a human from a mile yeah. away. Like you're, you're seeing a face. Well, I've seen helicopters, you know, light up a target and, you know, you can see the, the, the effects of it, but it's just different when you can see their face. Yeah. You know, you can see not scars, but you can see, you, I mean, that's a dude, you know, that's a guy. Like mannerisms just. Yeah. You know, you can yeah. see panic and you can see, you know, looking around, where is it coming from? And it just, you know, six or seven sniper teams engaging at once from different parts Jeez. of the city. Yeah, we were all, we were in a ring all over the city, so it was just chaos. Wow. Yeah. Can, can I ask you, Mark, you mentioned that you don't see the hit, the impact. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, I haven't been in that role before. You would think you're you're looking at some part of their body with a crosshair on them. You mm -hmm. pull the trigger, unless they're yeah. moving, I would assume <clears throat> you would see it go in. Why is it you wouldn't see the hit? Because the recoil of the of the of the the yeah. gun and you're 10 by 10 10 power. So if it comes off even a foot or an inch or five inches off of the platform, you're off target. So yeah. you do what's called call your shot. They drill this into. So when you pull the trigger, where on where was a crosshair on target? So then I would take a shot and I would say, I always shot low end to the right at four o'clock because I'm left-handed. So I tend to push a little bit. So if I call four o'clock and the round hits the target at four o'clock, spotter's like, yep, that's a good hit. Or or if I call four o'clock and it hits at eleven o'clock, you know, that wouldn't that wasn't a good shot. So I didn't call my shot properly. So but they I mean they drill that into you. So you know once you pull that trigger, you have a, a it's like a Kodak or snapshot screenshot of what the target looked like when you pull the trigger. And if your spotter says good hit, then you hit and, and it's like, hey, I call four o'clock. And he's like, yep, four o'clock, good hit. But it's it's constant. It's a constant communication between you and your spotter. Are you able to work with a new spotter fairly easily? Like, could you, yeah. are they interchangeable to some degree? Yeah. yeah, we all went through the same course, right? So we all have, we all have the same dialogue. It's like, if you get with a different sniper prepare, as you're on target and you're figuring out getting your range cards and seeing the target, you work through it. It's like, hey, when, when I call good hit, it's at four o'clock. If I call four o'clock, that's that's where I know I pull the trigger. And you, you just work through it and you practice while you're, you know, a lot of most of it's downtime. So um, it's like, hey, what do you see? Um, hey, I see the Mirage boiling. Um, right to left is a pre predominant. Yep, that's what I see too. And you just work through it. So by the time um, you get on target, and by the time it's time to shoot, you you figured it out. You know you have you're not doing like the big muscle movements of, hey, how do you cycle around? And, you know it's none of that. It's like hey, dial your dope in, and um, he checks out your gun. You check out his gun in case something happens and you need his gun. Hey, where's your where's your where's your dope log at? And you know, and then after a while, you just it's just quiet. And then, hey, got a target, two o'clock, you see it? Yep, got it. What's the wind doing? Still prevailing. Looks like it's uh, dying down, got to boil. And it's just this constant, like, check-ins. The the way you describe it in the book, you kind of stumble into sniper school, right? Which yeah. a lot of guys would kill for and wait a long time for. And you yeah. just, it's like one day they say, hey, we got an opening. We need you in here. Yeah. So what what it was making me wonder is, you know, a lot of people join, I, I would imagine the SEALs for the action, the door kicking, shoot, you know, like different things. Some mm -hmm. probably gravitate to being a sniper for various reasons, but yeah. given the way that you were thrust into the sniper role, was it something that you thought you would enjoy, did enjoy? It, I imagine it's very different from some of the other work. So it was, 
because I didn't have time to think about it, I was literally walking by the grinder and seeing chief name is Mike. And I hear this thunder like, Hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, Hey, just got back. Not a new guy anymore. He's like, pack up your shit. Um, we have one more billet for sniper school and you're going first class is in like 30 minutes. I'm like, I don't think you understand. <laughs> I'm what? Like, <laughs> yeah, that that was they needed bodies, and I was literally walking across the grinder when he needed a body at that moment. Two minutes on either side of that interaction, I would have missed it. Did you enjoy it though? You obviously the course is a pain. You know, it's tough as you describe, yeah. but like the the work itself, did you end up enjoying it or surprised by it? I was surprised that I did. I mean, it was a stress course, and I was stressed out the entire time because I was learning. Like the army marksmanship unit would show up and teach you how to shoot iron sight. Like, nope, not the close quarter stuff. It's like they were meticulous and I bugged the shit out of them. I was like, okay, what does this mean? What did you hear? They're like, green. You've you had enough, just absorb it all. I was like, okay, but you know, like, stop. You know, so they so um they would say, Okay, we're gonna do the the quarter drill and you're gonna go down to a penny. So you if you were flinching or something, they'd put a penny or a coin at the end of the barrel. And if you flinched, they would fall off to one side or the other. So you're like, okay, you're pushing too much or you're pulling too much. So I would just sit there and do coin drills and just figure out my trigger pull. And then on your own, on my own. Mm -hmm. And finally, I just bug the shit out of them. They're like, just go away. But I mean, I bear, I, you need to get an 80%. I got an 80, probably 80.2%, I'm sure. Um, but hey, the, the worst doctor in the class is still a doctor. <laughs> That's great. What, what is like the, the high, the, the class leader get on that? Uh, we always have uh, the honor man. So the, the we call it just the top performer. I, and I want, I don't know if Mike got honor man or not. He was close. Um, but I was just back of the back of the line, just like like, like everything rests on this test. I got to get a, I got to ace this test. And I would ace it, and, um, but then we got to the stalking portion. And the way my mind works is, how I see the world in let's say three D, right? But I get information in two D, so I need to ask questions to make it fit in a way that I learn. And then once I have it, I'm like, ah, okay, that makes sense. But if I don't get the ah, that makes sense, then I never pick it up. So the, the way they taught it was they gave you like, like no kidding, a 10 minute class on how to veg up your weapon. I'm like, okay, now it's for points. You're like, I don't even know what the hell I'm doing. So I sucked at stalking. And um, so that was the part that I was like, I learned a lot from that because when I went to the sniper course to teach, on the East Coast, I was like, my students are not going to have that moment. And the East Coast, they taught you the art of sniping. Uh, West Coast, the personality was a little bit different, but the East Coast are like, all right, for here's your three-day three, three day class on stalking, and you're going to go out on the field with your instructor with you, and he's going to walk you through it. And I was like, that's brilliant. Would have been well, nice. Yeah. So the best, the best thing I ever – got from my students was when they would fire me and what does that mean that i would i was like hey mario you know think about this and when you're looking at this what do you see right there and once they got the aha moment and i would say hey you know dave do this like mark i got it then i was fired mark i, I got this so then i would just kind of walk around and just make sure that they they would pass and my my students often graduate really high in the class because it's an art that you have to learn. And I assume that they learned like I did. And I just overfed them information until they're like, Mark, please be quiet. I got it. Okay. Don't fail. Don't fail your next test because I'm showing right up in your pocket next time. And um, so that was really, really rewarding. And um, I knew, and that's when I realized how I think and how I solve problems. And when I'm asking questions, I know I'm bugging the shit out of people, but it's like, I need to make this fit so I understand it. The way you're giving it to me, I just don't get it. And I need to learn this. Um, but when real world stuff happens, I perform a lot better than 
in a structured schoolhouse that, you know, you data dump, here's the information, dump it. Here's the information, on to the next thing. And so I could really work on my craft. And then when real war happened, I was like, no, yeah, I don't suck at this. I sucked in class. But uh... <laughs> I got to imagine that made you, it had to have made you so much better as an officer to have those experiences already. I can't yeah. even imagine the leg up that must give you. So, you know, I, I spent seven years on the enlisted side and I got to go to a, a cool school and I understood the, a lot of the best lessons I learned was what not to do. Um, so I had great lessons on what not to do. So I took all those lessons learned and said, okay, I'm ready to, to go, go to officer candidate school and do this for real. And to have the experience as the enlisted side, uh, I still knew the separation, I knew the rules, but I could dip my toe back into the enlisted side and say, hey, I know what you're doing over there. I was an E5 too, stupid, you know. <laughs> Don't even try it. Yeah. yeah, and then when they were going on, when we go do our workup, uh, you know, the tactic is, the tactics had changed, but the basics were still the same. And then the first thing I did when I had my first chief as an ensign, I challenged him to a gunfight. Like, we're gonna go shoot steel and who's who's gonna win? I didn't know this chief from anybody. I just, I just thought he was gonna beat the crap out of me, but I had to had to challenge him. I was like, Chief, you and I, right now, let's go. And Brian, luckily, I beat him. And then the guy's like, Oh, okay, this guy doesn't suck. And I'm like, wow. Whoo, fake that. Was <laughs> That's awesome. That's a good way to set the tone, though. I imagine. Yeah, like, but, hey, here's a yeah, competitive but, guy who's who's competent. Mm -hmm. But I was quiet, so they didn't quite. Uh, and like, I'm an introvert by nature. But I, I observe, I, I observe a lot. But if you engage me, I'm just like, oh, I, I'm smiling and all that stuff. But I would just, they they thought I was brooding, but I was just paying attention. Yeah. And they would give me shit. I was like, oh, I'm an E5 again. Hey, you know, uh, and then they're like, okay, this, okay, I get it. And they, they gave me the best um, gifts when, when I left that platoon. So not really? a lot of black seals, right? Even fewer black seal officers. So the paddle that they gave me, um, it's black. Not by mistake, <laughs> I'm guessing. Not by mistake. So the master chief, as as we're leaving the command, you know, he's a very stoic guy. He's like, "Hey, sir, something's disturbing is happening." I was like, "Good God, what is happening? Somebody died!" Like your platoon gave your paddle. I need you to read it. And he's like, "By the way." It's black. I was like, okay, okay, Master Chief. So the the inscription on it is, you know, you couldn't, it's like making um an 80s movie. You couldn't make Porky's now, right? You can't do it now. Yeah, no. you can't make Caddyshack now. Yeah. So if but he read the he read I read it and I just started to laugh. And he's and he's like, You're okay with it? I was like, Master, these are I mean, I went to war with these guys. He's like, good, because that's the funniest goddamn thing I've ever read. <laughs> That's awesome. And this is not the skinhead, I'm assuming. Who's no, the former no. skinhead? Because that is no, another. No, no. This was my, I was an 01. Okay. But that chief was the best chief I've ever had. He and I were like inseparable. You couldn't, you couldn't separate us. And we didn't always see eye to eye on stuff, but we were on the same page. And when, um, and I didn't care about his past. Who cares? You know, this is, said that happened when he was young. So he didn't know that I knew about it for half the workup. And when it all came out, he's like, hey, I got to tell you something. And I was like, oh, about your past? He's like, well, yeah. Like, of course I knew. You think I'm stupid? <laughs> but he's like, well, why did you say anything? He's like, because it doesn't matter. Who cares? Well, you and I get along <clears throat> so well now. And by the time he left, like families were doing stuff together. Um, he was just an exceptional guy. And his past didn't matter. Who cares? That's amazing. What was what was the difference in feeling going downrange as the officer compared to the enlisted SEAL at the time? The weight on your shoulders, if if it's different at all. So you're looking at your apertures open a lot more. I was looking at as enlisted guy, I was looking at what I did and maybe one or two people outside on my periphery. On the other side, I was looking at 
myself last and 16 dudes, their kids, their families, am I going to get them home safely? And one of the best pieces of advice I got was one of the guys said, hey, you know when you're being a good leader when your guys come to you with their problems? I was like, huh. Like if they don't come to you with their problems, they don't trust you. So up to the last day, you know, they'd knock on the door and say, hey, Mark, I got this going on. It's like, and internally, I was like, okay, good. So I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing this right because they still trust me. Yeah. And we just had that level of trust throughout the whole, the whole thing. So that's how it changes. Like when, when we would accept an op, you know, I would have to say, God, okay, we're, we might lose somebody on this one. So I was like, hey guys, we're going out and it's ugly out there. And I can't promise we're all coming back. I'm like, okay, got it. So it was just, it wasn't just the individual that I was looking at. And I learned that from dealing with, with Michael and when he passed, you know, my XO at the time who told me I had to do what I had to do. He understood. And he's like, Mark, I chose you because you could do it. I thought about all this other stuff, but the person that came up was Mark's going to do it because he's in this situation. It's the best. So with that platoon, I just, I mean, I love those guys. They were so much fun. You know, they're so smart. Was, they're so feisty. And, um, you know, I wasn't close to being the smartest guy in the room. You know, one of the guys was studying to be an engineer. His dream was to be an engineer and work on brain actuated prosthesis. Yeah. I'm wow. not smart. And then wow. one of the other guys got accepted to Harvard Law School and dudes were just so smart. And I knew I wasn't the smartest in the room, but once I let them know, I was like, hey, this is about this group. That's it. Everybody else is kind of an outsider. So if we have something going on, you guys come first and I'll take the hit for it. You worry about what you're doing. And you do the best job you can as a SEAL operator to learn your job and come home. I'll deal with the leadership and the head shit. Yeah. Getting into school and but why are you guys not shaved? Oh, that's chief. I'm sorry about that. You know, it never <laughs> so, ends. Yeah. So the the code word was when something would come down the pipe that was kind of BS. I was like, when everyone leaves, we'll reassess. And they're like, okay, yeah, we reassess. So. <laughs> I like that. I wish I had yeah. used that, man. That's a good yeah. one. Yeah. So, so that was code for, yeah, I get it. This is dumb. When we get away from prying eyes, we'll reassess this thing and make sure it's the right thing. And like, ah. so when something would come down with all, just kind of look at the corner of their eye and like, yeah, master, if we're going to reassess that and uh, we'll get right back to you and all the guys are like, yes. yes. <laughs> Can you can you take us through, Mark, maybe just one op that you remember when you were um, leading that platoon in particular? We were working with our partners in Israel. It was, remember the blockade that happened back in 2009? It was all in the news and the Israelis got over overwhelmed for a short amount of time by people on the boat and then they figured it out. Well, we worked with those guys. So we were um, in country. The whole platoon was there. And we did an exchange and like, hey, mission is you have to find this, your target in this building. Everything's blacked out. You guys got to go, go find them. So we, we reconvene and say, okay, guys, team one, you're on perimeter. Team two, you're doing this. Here's everybody's position. And um, I'm going to check in. And once I give you the double clicks, we're radio silent and we're, we're going to go. It was so cool because it was just this ballet of precision, right? Uh, Mikey walked with the limp. One of the guys, um, his, his headset was always crooked or something. Was, so in total darkness, I knew, everybody knew what their job was. And it was just precision and it was quiet. So we come back down with, because they had people, lane graders was what they called them. So they would follow us around but we were so quiet they lost us in the dark so all of a sudden 20 minutes later we come down with it with the hvt and like here you go and they're like well so how did you how did you do that i was like we didn't hear you for 30 minutes 
the whole, the entire time you were talking, we didn't hear a thing. So we actually lost you. And I was just like, well, you know, we're pretty good. That's awesome. What but a great it was, feeling. It was, the cool thing was because we're working with combat veterans in the Middle East and Israel. They're, you know, they have their own expertise and they're working real targets all the yeah. time. So to to earn that respect, they're like, yeah, we didn't know what was going on. We just knew. And they, I mean, they had dossiers on all of us to like, well, we knew this guy came from a different platoon and he's not one of your guys. And he's also not one of your guys, but how'd you make it work? I was like, well, we have a core of how we do business. We incorporated these two guys with these three guys and said, hey, here's how we're doing business. And you're no less of an asset than the guys who worked with us. And, you know, this is your job. I'm like, all right, boss, got it. And it was the level of trust that the guys had in, in me as their leader. And they said to the guys, like, don't worry, he's got it. Like, we trust him. Yeah. We trust you. This is circle of trust. You're we're, you're new to this platoon, but you have not, you have the 90% solution. So our 10% is just a little weirder. Um, and boss is not going to be hands-on. He's going to let you do your thing. And, but the expectation was I'm an equal expert at doing my thing, which was sometimes it's like shut up and color and let the guys do their business and work the assets or, you know, do the comms or, you know, so it was very, everything was very, from the outside, it looked very rigid, right? Uh, but internally, we were just, we just had it dialed in. That's awesome. How hard was it to write the book for you, Mark? It was hard because I figure so many people have such a better story than I do. You know, <laughs> just, I mean, some of these guys just have these amazing stories. So when Pivotal Moments Media, I met the CEO and he's like, man, you, um, you have a great story. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Somebody else has a lot better story. And I would do speaking events at University of Southern California when I retired. And one time, Michael Gervais, I don't know if you know Michael Gervais. He's, he's still, Michael speaking to the class. And some kid said, hey, what's it like for the special operations community to do mental toughness? He's like, funny you should ask. We have one right here. And I'm looking around. I was like, oh, well, there's another special operations guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he said, Mark's going to explain it to you right after break. He's like, Mark, so just go ahead and get prepped and you're going to talk to the class. I'm like, you motherfucker. So, <laughs> So I, I went up and talked with the class and they it was it went really well. And then one time Kobe Bryant was supposed to speak and he just he couldn't make it. So my friend from USC called and said, Hey Mark, I know you're getting ready to go home. Can you come talk to the class? I was like, Yeah, yeah, Glenn, I'll talk to the class. So I just told my blockbuster story, my SEAL story, and it was so much it was not about being a seal for the most part it was just hey this is this is this is my journey good bad ugly this is what it is i hope you like it but um this is it and when glenn would survey the class and say hey you know we've had xyz come in we've had all these people come in who do you want to come in if you could make wave a magic wand who would come in and so many of them said we'd love to have mark back wow yeah so i became this keynote speaker that i I do it every year. I've done it since 2017. That's cool. Yeah. So, so anyway, the CEO of Pivotal Moments is he's, he's pushing me to write a book, and his friend was in class um, and watched me do the speaking event. And he said, "Bob, these Mark's 50s. He's 50 at the time. He was talking to these 18 to 22 year olds, and like they didn't, they weren't on their phones, they weren't looking around. He's, they're like." They were dialed in. So finally, Bob calls me and says, hey, you know, when are you going to write your book? I'm like, ah. He's like, all right, I'm sick of you. Here's X, Y, Z. You have four ghostwriters. Pick one. And you got six months. Damn. Like, oh, okay. All right, so I guess I'm writing a book. So, awesome. um, so then I started to look at, I knew I wanted to be about transitions, but I didn't know how to paint that picture yet. So then it was like, well, I struggled with my transition. 
sometimes to a high level. And I once I got the stat of so many veterans are taking their own lives, I was like, okay, we got we have to do something to stuff because there's that sweet spot. I think they determined it's about 18 months between the time they get out of their service time to the time that they're they kind of figured out the new landscape. It was roughly about 18 months, but so many of them are taking their own lives. And I realized that transition didn't really affect, didn't only affect the service member, it affects the kids, it affects the dog, it affects your spouse. I mean, everybody's affected by this transition that I, I one, experienced it for myself, but then I worked with veteran students who were leaving surf and then coming to a top 20 university in Los Angeles. You know, that's a transition. And, and I got to see how they struggled with their transition. Maybe it's just fitting in or not speaking the language or I'm 26 and I'm around a bunch of 18 year olds who don't know anything. So it was, that was a real struggle for them. But then the thing kept coming up with my wife is she was used to this one lifestyle, but now we're living in a two bedroom apartment in LA and she's having a hard time and my kids don't, and it's like, well, this is a family thing. So when I was writing it, I wanted to not only hit service members, but family members, athletes, entrepreneurs who are leaving the their baby that they grew from infancy and was successful. And all of a sudden somebody buys it and they're out of a job. And now what? I really enjoyed the book. I know people who listen to this show will love it. So you can get it on Amazon. I got a Kindle version. I'm going to order a hard copy. So I have it here behind me. Um, Mark, there's two questions I ask everybody before, uh, before I let you go here pretty quick. One is, is there anything that you carried with you when you were deployed that had sentimental value, something that somebody gave you that you wanted to have on you? Good luck charm, something to that effect. I made, um, a little picture of my daughter, Riley. Um, she and I were, I think she was visiting in Guam and, uh, we just had this picture. Of, it was just this very genuine, playful moment that I had with with my daughter. Um, and then I had a picture of my son. He was on my back, and he's just euphoric. He's just the mouth is open. You can tell he's just happy, you know. So whenever I was, you know, like lonely or something, I would just look at those, and they just made me laugh, you know, or smile, or just remember teach him how to ride his bike or, you know, go on a first date with my daughter when she was yeah. two. And I was like, well, I don't know what the hell to do with this kid, but let's go on a date <laughs> to the park. Um, so that, that was it. And it was just um, those small mementos that I didn't carry them out into the field with me, but they were in my, in my locker. And every time, even to this day, if I see those pictures, I'm like, <laughs> that's yeah, <funny>. that's <laughs> awesome. That's a good one. Um, and then the last question I ask everybody, uh, looking back on a very long career, losing people, many near death experiences, which I highly recommend people pick up the book just to hear some of these, um, but also the transitions and the tough times you went through. As you look back at that time, would you go back and do that again? Every, every step. I would take every step exactly the same because there was growth through struggle and some obstacles that you had to figure out and because i came out on the other side much better than when i started that journey it's all vital and it's all who it's all who who i am today even though the core of me is still the same but through all through all the stuff that you go through all the ups and downs that's what was it What's the metaphor that you you get this vase and you fill it up with big rocks, right? And take oh rest. yeah, yeah. But that I helps. have so much sand that's so valuable and vital to my experience. That's you know, there's little little grains of sand that fill up those spaces. That uh, I have so much of that sand like that. Like yeah, that. it's it was a fun. It's been an it's been a fun journey. So if if I die today, like my father died my age. You know, I can look back and say, you did everything you were supposed to do, and then some. And did you make people, did you piss some people off? Yep. But when people look back at the experience that they had with you, are they going to say, hey, you know what? If, if I could model some behavior off of what Mark did, 
he did this really well and he did this really well and and um from my platoon guys to my kids to people who send me direct messages on instagram i answer all of them because it's it's important where can people find you there mark just we'll have it in the show notes too but just uh, the how, mark, how do they find you be mark green on, across all the um platforms instagram's the same facebook's are the same my my media social media person lexi made me get tiktok uh so if you do you like the social media posts i did them if you don't like them lexi did them so talk to lexi yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's the Mark Green at um at all those platforms and the website's themarkgreen.com where you can get the book and speaking events and the adventures. I think this is all just starting. And uh cool. say yes to everything. So that's uh we'll be busy. <laughs> that's perfect. Thanks so much, Mark. I really appreciate the time and and you digging into some of these pretty tough moments with us. It's been great. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. I'm always fascinated when I hear from SEALs and we can talk just a little bit about their time in BUDS because it is, as everybody has seen, such a grueling test and it eliminates so many people from contention. And one of the things we didn't touch on here that is great in his book, and when Mark said that he talks about the good, the bad, and the ugly, he really does. He's got this scene at BUDS where he's on the beach and in his description says he has a temper tantrum basically with some of the cadre, but a very important lesson is learned. Um, about keeping your word. So, you know, I, I think many of you will go and pick up the book. It's a very quick read. It's got some great stories, though, about um, about his time overcoming some challenges that I think a lot of people face, but within the military context, especially. But this was another good one, and it just reminded me that he, he does cover a lot of ground in the book, and it's worth picking up. Uh, just before we get into some comments, if you're interested, we've got a newsletter. It's combatstory.com slash newsletter. It's got what we're watching, doing, uh, focused on for that particular week, a little bit of history, military or intel history, and maybe a quote or a joke or something. Pretty short, uh, nice little weekend update. Um, and also you can check out our Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash combat story to help us keep this going. And please do, um, if you haven't already subscribed on YouTube, please hit subscribe. It's even better if you can turn on notifications so you can see when we have stuff coming out. Um, and if you can give us a like, um, or a five-star review on Spotify or Apple podcasts, that'd be greatly appreciated. It helps us get out to more people and a couple comments from the most recent Tom Moser interview. And this is of course, Tom, uh, Gunny Moser, the F-15, uh, Eagle pilot, uh, I should say the F-15E strike Eagle fighter pilot. Um, and first comment here is from one of our subscribers. Mr. Shaoshe, I think. And it's, wow, another awesome top tier vet and top tier interview. Oh, and top tier sound. And then Huck's dad, 08, another subscriber says, uh, fascinating life, one of my favorite episodes to date. And yeah, Tom's background, the way he's gone through life, cop, um, Marine, fighter pilot, now airline pilot, and round two, you'll hear even more from him about his time downrange really interesting stuff um and uh richard bowles 7690 says what a team tom and mrs mosers a serious team when she says only winners in this house another great video many insights to life and not just the military thank you both and then lastly d18 racer 51 another subscriber uh, another great episode keep going love the podcast and i just want to say thanks to those who do subscribe means a ton to us and, and gets us just a little more traction each time. And uh, we're chipping away as we go through this. So thank you. All of that helps. And with that, hope you have a great rest of your week or weekend, wherever you are. And stay safe, y'all.